Matthew chapter 22. Um, I prayed about, it was kind of like the last minute that I knew that uh, Harold couldn't be here. And um, I was really praying about what to, what, to, you know, what to share tonight. And it's just kind of uh, just the family tonight here. So that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, of course, we all know that we're coming up next year as an election year. And uh, I, I wanted to, uh, there's been a discussion <clears throat> on Facebook. You have to excuse me, my voice a little. But a friend of mine on Facebook had posted a, 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 a Facebook, whatever, message. It's not a tweet. A tweet is the Twitter, but this is Facebook. And he talked about the, the possibility that we might face of having to choose between, you know, Barack Obama and a Mormon, okay? Because Mitt Romney is a Mormon, and he's amongst the highest in the polls. And there's a discussion about voting for a Mormon. And I wanted to, tonight, just talk a little bit about uh, rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And, uh, you know, when we get around next year, around this time, we'll be... We'll be right in the heat, in the thick of things. I dread it. I dread elections. Uh, just because all the, all just like the ugly stuff that gets said. And people just say such, such stupid things. But, uh, and, and I remember the last time we had a presidential election, we had like Christian Voters Guide. And we'll probably have another one of them before, before November. But uh, in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 22, <clears throat> It says, it's a story we've read a million times. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. This was the last week of Jesus' life before the crucifixion, the Passion Week. And we know that all through that week, he was under such intense attack from the powers that be. They wanted, they wanted to kill Jesus. They were just looking for some reason, some way, some... some uh, some cause they would have to come against him. And they sent out unto him their disciples with Herodians, the Pharisees and Herodians. They usually didn't get along together, but in this case, they seemed to find some common ground. And they said, Master, we know that you are true and teach the way of God and truth. Well, they were lying. They didn't know that. They believed that he was a charlatan and an, and a, an imposter. He says, we know that you're true and you teach the way of God and truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, Caesar or not? Said Jesus, we know that you don't care what anybody thinks. You speak your mind. You say what you want to say. So tell us. Should we pay taxes <clears throat> to the Roman authority, Caesar? Now, that question really kind of brings forth a lot of different possibilities, all of them pretty negative, because at that day, the Roman Empire was governed by, they had a Senate that was elected, they had a Roman Senate, but, and at one time in the Roman Empire, the Senate was very powerful. They were elected representatives, much like what we have today. A lot of what we have in our country is, is uh, fashioned after ancient Rome and ancient Greece, but uh, they had a Senate. But by the time of Jesus, the Senate was pretty much more or less kind of like a rubber stamp thing because they had an emperor. And by the time of Christ, the emperor had gained a status of being almost a god. Well, they did worship him as a god. So to say paying tribute to Caesar was tantamount to saying, should we bow down to Caesar? That's what, that was their implication because there were two schools of thought in those days just like there are today there are different schools of thought one group of Jews said well you know we live here they're the authority uh, we need to pay our taxes the other group said you know if we pay money to Rome we're saying that they're greater than our God <clears throat> uh, there were many of them who uh, revolted there, there were times when people would rise up and try to revolt against the Roman Empire and they were usually crushed because the Romans were mighty and powerful. But that kind of thing is nothing new. Our nation was birthed out of uh, revolution. It was revolution about, it wasn't about religion, it was about money, it was about taxes. You know, today we have the Tea Party, okay? That's named after the Boston Tea Party. And what was the Boston Tea Party about? They were upset because the British were charging them outrageous taxes, and they didn't have any representation in the British Parliament. 
So, so the, the phrase came, taxation without representation is tyranny. How many people remember that? That's one of the few things I remember learning in high school. Taxation without representation is tyranny. Most everything else I've, I've forgotten. But I remember that. And that's what sparked our revolution. It was about being able to print money and uh, coin money because whoever coins money really controls the place. Okay? So whoever's, whoever's, whoever's printing the money and making the cash, they're the ones that, that pull the strings. Uh, so they asked him this question. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar? Now, they figured they had him in a corner because if he would have said no, no, you shouldn't pay tribute to Caesar. Then they would have been able to go to the Roman authority and say, hey, there's this guy here uh, mounting insurrection against Rome, like the other rabble-rousers. And they would have come and arrested him and threw him in jail. If he would have said, yes, it's okay to pay tribute to Caesar, then they would have said, what kind of Messiah is this? Is this the God of Israel? Is this, is this uh, you know, God's sent chosen servant? And he's telling us we need to bow down to the Roman emperor. So they figured they had him in a corner. They say yes, whether he says no, he's going to be jammed up. And they'd be able to point a finger at him and accuse him to somebody. Of course, we know what Jesus said. He perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you tempt me, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. So they reached in and they got out, you know, and... Uh, this is a 20. I don't think I have a one, but, you know, you look on this thing, and it says United States of America. Then it says in God we trust, $20. And there's a picture of old Andrew Jackson there. Andrew Jackson does, doesn't come to church very much. George Washington comes to church a lot. Does anybody have a one? Does, does anybody have a one handy? Just a $1 bill handy? I, I just, I just want to uh, just... Yeah, we got one right here. Okay. Thank you. You, you know how to make a million dollars? Just do that to a million people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll give it back to you, Patty. I will. <laughs> but we see uh, it says Federal Reserve Note. I don't know what it reserves because I don't know how much gold we have. And there's a picture of old George Washington on there, the founder or the father of our country. And on the back, you see this seal with the eagle and the arrows. And, uh, you know, uh, I can't, it's, I'm too small, I can't read it. And then you see that, you see that weird-looking pyramid. You ever wonder about that weird-looking pyramid right there without the top on it? I used to look at that and say, what in the world is that all about? I don't, you know, maybe that's like, actually, it is the top of the Washington Monument. Is, if, you, if you look, it's a pyramid like that, just like that. And uh, it says, uh, 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 Novo Order Seclorum, New World Order, underneath there. That's what it is in Latin and so forth. And this is, you know, in God we trust. It doesn't say which God, but this is in God we trust. And the United States of America. So uh, Jesus said, well, you know, give me, you know, show me a coin. Show me the tribute money. And they brought him a penny. And he said unto them, what's it say on there? Whose image is that? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. Now, this is issued under the authority of the United States of America. Here you go. Thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I'll give it back to you. So, ultimately, you know, the United States government has gold, supposedly, to back that up. That supposedly represents gold or some kind of precious thing. And it's, it has a value to it. And it's a tool. We've talked before about money. It's a tool. We can use it for good things. We could use it for evil things. But ultimately, Jesus said, you know, we live in this world. Now, they lived in, during the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, when they conquered a place like Israel, they would establish, they wouldn't just wipe them out, but they would send their leaders in there, and they would exact tribute off of them. They would take money from them. They would make them pay taxes. And usually it would be, they would be exorbitant taxes because it wasn't their people. So the money, when, when Jesus said, you know, who's, what, whose picture is on that? And he said, it's Caesar's. 
So he said, well, if that's Caesar's, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. We live, and I've said this so many times, we live in a, in a dual citizenship. Now, we happen to have our citizenship in the United States of America. At that time, they were citizens of Palestine, and people in the world today live in different countries. But we live here. So what Jesus is saying is that there's, there's a, there's, it's, it's, it's very proper to, to recognize our, our citizenship in the United States of America and live here peaceably and lawfully according to the laws of the land. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So it behooves us as believers living in the United States of America in the 21st century to be, and we're blessed to live in a country that we can take part in our government. We can take part in selecting our leaders. We can take, play a part in that, even though it seems like a small part. I'm just one vote. You're just one vote. It seems like a very small part, but yet we have that privilege of doing that, that right to do it, and we have the right not to do it if we don't want to. See, I always, you know, people would always tell me, uh, they would always say this, if you don't vote, you don't count. You ever hear that? <clears throat> well, that's not in the Constitution. If you're a citizen of the United States, you're supposed to count whether you vote or not. It doesn't say you only count if you vote. You can't complain to the government if you don't vote. You can't, it doesn't say that. We all have the right to, you know, send letters to our congressmen and senators, whether we voted or not. We have that right to do that. But I really believe personally that it's a good thing to vote. It's a good thing to register and to exercise, you know, give your opinion. I know some people who, uh, and I know one person in particular I was, I was speaking with, he said that, you know, when it comes to like president, if he's not a born again Christian, he's not voting. If there's not a, 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 a clear cut born again Christian running for office, he's not going to vote. And he has the right to do that. The thing is, over the past, as long as I've been alive, I don't think we have ever had a born-again Christian in the office. I've, I've never heard of one running, at least not for very long. Pat Robertson did for a while, but that didn't last too long, you know. And, uh, you know, there might have been a few others. But ultimately, the people that run really don't impress, have not impressed me. You know, Jimmy Cotter was supposed to be a born-again Christian. But I read some of the stuff that he's written, and he, he, he ain't talking like a Christian either. George Bush was a born-again Christian, but he said every, everybody goes to heaven. It's... It's, it's, it's just, you know, all these people, when we go to vote, if we're going to vote only for somebody who's a Christian, we'd never vote. And that's okay. You know, if, if, that's, a, if that's a standard, see, our voting thing, that's a, personal, that's a personal, you know, decision that we have to make. And nobody has the right to judge us and say you should or should. Now, some people use that as an excuse because they're just too lazy to go vote. And that's another thing. But, okay, now, I've said all that to say this. I Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things unto God that are God's, okay? Who do we belong to? We belong to the Lord. We belong to God. If you're born again and washed in the blood of Jesus, we're his. Our first commitment is to him. Our second commitment is to this land that we live in. So provided that laws don't force us to do things that, that directly go against our conscience with our Savior, then we need to obey the laws, okay? I want you to look at another passage with me. <clears throat> Uh, over in Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> well, we actually we should back up a little bit to chapter 12. Verse look at tw chapter 12 and verse 18. <clears throat> It says this, if it be possible, read that, if it's possible, sometimes it's not possible, but if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. That means the ones in the church, the ones outside the church, our next door neighbors, the people, we should, you know, the, the, no road rage, okay? <laughs> if somebody cuts you off, you ought to live peaceably right. with them, all right? <laughs> we ought to... Mm, okay. Come on, be honest with yourself. Have you ever had road rage? Have you ever demonstrated? I mean, everybody thinks when you're driving, somebody cuts you off, you get mad, but have you ever demonstrated? Okay. 
All right. He says this. And this is generally, this isn't just those of the household of faith. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, this is very general. This isn't just talking about, you know, in the body of Christ. This is a very general uh, commandment to us that as citizens of the United States, or whatever nation we're living in, but of course we're living in this nation, that it, we owe it to our Lord to try to be peace, live peaceably with our neighbors, live peaceably with the people on the road. Uh, we, we owe it to our Lord not to take it upon ourselves to try to get vengeance or get back at people. Uh, and in fact, if we have an enemy, we ought to do everything we can to appease that enemy, not just to shut him up, but to show him the love and mercy of God. That's what we're commanded to do. He begins that chapter by saying, present yourselves a living sacrifice. Okay, Now that's hard to do. I don't care who you are, it's hard to do. If somebody's messing with you, it's hard to try to be nice to them. Okay? It's just the way it is. But it's, it's what we're told. He says, be not overcome of evil. Don't let evil overcome you, but overcome evil with good. Okay? Now, chapter 13. Here we go. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. What higher powers is he talking about? He's not talking about the Lord, because he's talking to Christians. We understand that. The higher powers he's talking about here are the ones in authority. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. He says, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, now try to understand the context in which Paul gave this, made this statement. He lived in the Roman Empire. He was a Roman citizen by birth. He was born in the city of Tarsus. <clears throat> His emperor was, it, 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 differing times, at this time it might have been uh, Tiberius or could have been Nero. Whoever it was, the Roman emperors were notorious, especially around this time, the Roman emperors were notorious as being evil, wicked, mean, and crazy. Nero burnt half the city down, blamed it on the Christians. Okay. That's who his higher powers were. The Senate of Rome. That's who he was saying to be subject to. <clears throat> he said that those powers were ordained of God. Nero? He was a madman. The other Roman emperors wanted to kill Christians because they wouldn't bow down to worship him. Do you know that God can ordain wicked people to accomplish his purpose? People talk today about Barack Obama, okay? I believe Barack Obama is there because God wanted him there. I don't, you know, I, don't, he's, I didn't vote for him, okay? <laughs> I didn't vote for him. Everybody, but I'd like to meet some of the folks that did. Everybody said they didn't. But, you know, here's the thing. <clears throat> if he's there, it's not like God is standing up in heaven saying, oh, how did this happen? He's there for a reason. Nero was there for a reason. The powers that be, the people that are sitting on the Supreme Court, God knows who they are. They didn't get there without his permission. The people who are in our Congress, our Senate, our congressmen, <clears throat> God knows who they are. Do you think he's out of control of our government? Was he out of control of the Roman government? God used pagan kings in the Old Testament. Clearly, he used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Cyrus. He, he used Darius uh, to accomplish his purpose. So Paul is saying here that the powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now again, we live in a nation that has a constitution, that has a, a, a set of laws and statutes. We live in a city. There are laws and statutes in our city. They, they all, at one time or another, somebody had a reason for putting those laws into existence. You might agree with them or disagree with them. 
But unless a law causes you to go against God, unless a law causes you to do something that you knew would be displeasing to your Lord, it behooves us to obey the law. It's quiet. It, it behooves us to, 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 to follow the speed limit. It's there for a reason. That's a simple one. You know, zoning laws are there for a reason. Sometimes I hear stories and people will get all banana shape about people who live in residential areas that want to start a church in their house. Okay? Now, I believe in preaching the gospel and so forth, and if I want to have people over my house. and But what happens if you want to have church in your house and there's 50 cars? And, and, and the neighbors come home and try to park, and there's no place to park because you're having church in your house. There's a reason for zoning laws. They weren't all passed to persecute Christians. We need to follow the laws. Now, there, there are coming times, and, and I've heard stories of this, where cities have tried to use zoning laws against churches. Okay, there, there is a movement in a lot of our cities where they're trying to use these zoning laws to almost persecute or keep churches from existing or growing. Okay, that happens too. That, that, you know, the spirit of Antichrist is at work here. But we need to be able to follow the laws of the land. Taxation. We pay taxes. We ought, to, we ought to pay our taxes. I don't like doing it. But they're there for a reason. The fact that they're mishandling the money the fact that our government has taken our tax money and thrown it to the wind, they have to answer for that. But they're taxes. Okay? Listen to what he says. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves, what? Damn. The Apostle Paul is writing this. He lived in Rome. Okay? For rulers, now listen, now my, we could read this and say, well, he doesn't, live, he doesn't live in the United States of America in 2011. He says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. If you stop at the stop sign, you won't get a ticket. If you obey the speed limit, you won't, you won't get pulled over. Obey the law. Okay? Look what he says in verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. For he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath excuse me, upon him that does evil. The purpose of government. When God ordained human government, he ordained human authority in the secular realm. And he did so, the main purpose of human government is to keep order in a society. Government, human government was not meant to feed poor people. It wasn't. The church ought to be doing that. People, individuals ought to be doing that. They ought to be helping one another. The government was not designed to give people health care. It wasn't. I thank God in the, in the nation that we live in, we, you know, people have access to health care. That's wonderful, and you need to take advantage if that's there. But that wasn't the government's, you know, that's not what God meant the government to be. The government was not meant to be a, uh, a philanthropic organization. It was meant to keep the peace and keep order. The philanthropy is supposed to come from people. We're supposed to help one another. But what happens? It, be, it all revolves around money and power, okay? This was happening in our nation right now. He says he's the minister of God. You know, this, this police officer that was killed. I wonder how many policemen understand that they are ministers of God. Whether they be state policemen or local policemen. I wonder how many mayors and councilmen and they, I wonder how many of them understand that the position they hold is actually a ministry. It's a ministry of God. If all of them would have that, if half of them would have that mentality, I think we'd be in a whole different situation than we are right now. They think they're in it for themselves. They're just, you know, they make their, could you imagine, I, I wish I would have had a job where I could just, you know, make my own pay. Yes. What do you want paid? I want this much. Okay. 
<clears throat> I wish I had a job where I could have just signed off on, you know, lifetime health care and lifetime pension 100%. Boy, boy, that sounds, I think I'm going to run for office. Serve two years and you're in. See, they lost, if they would realize that they're, there, that they're supposed to be ministers of God instead of out just looking for, you know, what they can get, we'd be in a whole lot different situation than we are right now. But what happens, there's an old saying, it's not in the Bible, but it's true. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay. Now. It says in verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. Uh, verse 5. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause, pay your taxes. <laughs> okay. Paul. Paul, you don't know what they're... For he says, for this cause, pay ye tribute. Now, he was living in the Roman Empire. He was writing this to people living there. He said, pay your taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. You know, the taxes and tribute that we pay are supposed to support our government in keeping order. And what are they using them for? What are they using them for? For lifetime pensions and health care. And, okay, now, he says this. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. What he's saying is the same, the same thing Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Owe no man anything, in verse 8, but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's our responsibility as Christian citizens of the United States of America. It doesn't mean we can't have opinions. It doesn't mean that we can't express our opinions. Thank God that we have the right to be able to stand up and express our opinions. If I don't like what the government's doing with my tax money, I can write a letter to the editor. I can call a talk show. I can write a letter to my congressman. And I should not have to fear any kind of repercussion from the government. We have that. Thank you. There's some places they can't do that. There's a lot of places in the world where if you say anything, you'll probably end up gone. or thrown in jail somewhere. Thank God we have that. We need to be thankful that we live in the United States of America. So render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. I hope, I hope we understand that. And everybody in here tonight, you've all been here for a while, and I think you're all pretty well rooted in the word. And you understand that, that you know, we're citizens of the United States, we're, but first we're citizens of heaven. And we need to obey the law in the best way we can. Pay our taxes. Do what we're supposed to do. Now, the question that I started out with, and there's a lot more in the word that uh, Paul tells us over in uh, 1 Timothy to pray for those who are in authority. And don't pray that they, like, get hit by a car. Okay. But pray that they, you know, pray that they get saved. Wouldn't it be something if Barack Obama got on his knees and repented and got saved? You just imagine watching that on TV news. Just imagine what they would do with that. If he got down on his knees on the steps of the Capitol Bill and said, God, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. <laughs> Can you just imagine that? Wouldn't that be wonderful if he got saved? Okay, now, now, here's the question. Here's the question. If next year at this time we have a choice between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, who is a Mormon. Now, now here's what I'm, I want to say this before I say anything else. How you vote is your business, or whether you vote is your business. Okay, I'm not standing up here to tell you how you should vote. I don't want nobody telling me how I should vote. But I want to equip you. I know some of you might be registered Republican. There's going to be a, uh, a nominating, a primary coming up in a few months. It's coming up. There are all the debates, all the rhetoric that's going around right now. We have never had a born-again Christian run for office, a president, as, as long as I've been, that I, I consider, you know, truly was, okay. So, the idea of somebody having to be a Christian to vote for him, I, I don't believe that's the case. I believe we could vote for somebody because we agree with their stance politically and domestically and socially. Okay. 
But what about somebody who's a practicing Mormon? A member of what I consider to be a cult. Okay. Mormonism, if you look at the history of Mormonism, all the way back, you know, Joseph Smith in the early 1800s had a vision, supposedly had a vision, and we know the story. We've seen it, Book of Mormon, we've seen all that. Okay. In, the, in the years before his death, Joseph Smith, who was martyred, he literally were, was espousing a, an uprising against the United States of America. His, his dream, one of his goals was to raise an army and to rewrite the Constitution of the United States of America. He wanted to see the Latter-day Saints come into power and authority and control of the United States of America. Now, <clears throat> at that time, that was almost laughable because he had like a militia, but they were nothing compared to the United States Army. And, and when, when he was killed in Nauvoo, Illinois, he was, he was murdered, he was martyred. Uh, the leadership fell to a fellow named Brigham Young, Brigham Young University, BYU, okay? And he took him on the long trek out to Utah, Salt Lake City. That's the bastion of Latter-day Saints right now. That's where they are. And even in those early days, he was espousing open revolt against the United States of America. And, and it's, you can read it in his writings and the documents and in the books and the things that, you know, that the Mormons have. It's there. It's, it's available. You can read that stuff. Okay. In the, toward the late 1800s, I believe, uh, I can't remember the exact date. I think it was right after the Civil War. Utah wanted to become a state of the United States of America. The only thing that was holding them back was that they practiced polygamy. The Mormons practiced polygamy openly. They taught it as a doctrine. Okay? So before they could allow them to become a state, they had to, like, outlaw polygamy. So they outlawed polygamy. You know. And they kind of made a thing where they could get married, like, spiritually to all these different women. And some of the fundamental Mormons still practice polygamy. This Warren Jeffs out here, you know, some of them are really crazy. But they, they outlawed polygamy, and they became a state. A hundred years, 150 years later, there's a Mormon running for president of the United States. Okay? Now, listen. I don't care. You know, I'm going to give you an opinion. You can take your leave in. I don't care. If I don't, I, I, I don't judge people according to their faith. You know, Nixon was a Quaker. Uh, um, Carter was supposedly born again Baptist. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was, I think, brother in church. Uh, uh, I don't know what Bill Clinton was. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, you know, George Bush was probably you know, all these other things. I, and when I, when I, to decide to vote for him or not, I never used that as a criteria where they went to church or what they believed. But this one, the teachings of Mormonism, and we've heard it and we've said, are anti, definitively anti-Christ. They're anti-Christ. So, we're citizens of the United States of America, and we're given the right and the privilege to exercise our opinion and how we vote. We can choose to vote or choose not to vote. I would encourage you to pray very, very sincerely for God's leading. Because I've read things where people will say, well, you know, whether he's a Mormon or not, it doesn't really matter. He's, you know... Uh, Pro-life, I think. I'm not even sure if he's that, but he's, he's a you know, fiscal conservative, da-da-da. It's really what we want. And, you know, practically and, uh, you know, circumstantially, I mean, it makes sense. On paper, it, you know, he, he looks like the right guy. But he hates Jesus. He openly 
because of his Mormon faith. He'll, see, he'll call himself Jesus Christ, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But they deny the Jesus of the Bible. Openly, he's not just like a lukewarm Christian, like most of them are. He's not just like a Christian by name, like most of them are. But he is adamantly opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in the Word. Do I believe that Mitt Romney is a conspirator trying to take over the nation? No, I don't. I believe he's a sincere individual, probably a good guy. A sincere individual that really sees a need for a, a conservative president and things that change in our nation. I believe he probably means well. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, please don't go around and say, if Carmen's going to, Pastor Carmen's going to be mad at me if I vote for Mitt Romney. I won't be. That's your business. I don't care how you vote. Even if you tell me, I won't be mad at you because it's your, that's, your, that's your choice. When last, last time we had, you know, Christian Voters Guide, we were talking about John McCain and Barack Obama. And I tried to present a fair, you know, list of what they believe and what they stand for. If somebody voted for the person I didn't vote for, that's, that's their business. I, you know, I don't get into political arguments. I'll just tell you how I feel. But as we render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, we need to keep in mind what's first and foremost is our commitment to the Lord. Amen? Some people will say, well, he's probably the only one that can beat him. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Because I don't care, you know, who wins. God is still my God. He's still in control. You know, I don't care... And I, I, I said this, and I'm closing. You know, people have said, and I mentioned this before, they said, well, if you don't vote, you, you don't count. You know, when I'm beginning to think, even if you do vote, I wonder how much you count. And I think the only ones that count are the ones that count. <laughs> okay. That's the, way, that's the way it seems it has happened in our nation. If you don't have the big bucks... You're just at their mercy. But see, that's okay. I'm at God's mercy. He's the one. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He's the one. They can take, you know, they take away my health care. I'll just have to depend on him. If I die, he'll take me home. What's wrong with that? Send me to heaven. <laughs> okay. Amen. All right. Anybody have any comments or questions? I Thank you all for bearing with me tonight. They promise you anything to get elected. And I, I, I got a kick out of this. Uh, not a kick, but I mean, now, now there are like two movements. Okay, I put a couple blurbs on YouTube about this. We have the Tea Party, okay? And we have Occupy. You know, like Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Pennsylvania, okay? If you look at the difference, the Tea Party is, is a very conservative uh, you could call them right wing. When they get together, they have a rally, they have speakers, they have music. And they, you know, like a pep rally. Because they're like the, the, you know. The other group, the Occupy, they're the ultra liberals. When they get together, they camp out in, in New York City, in Wall, where Wall Street is. Where they've been there for, I guess, like a, like a couple months. And this park that they're in, they're, they're like, they, they go to the bathroom there, and they have sex there, and they take drugs there. I mean, it's like right out in the open. They wanted them to leave for a day so they could hose the place down. The, the conservative group wants to see reform in our government and they're called, by the liberal media, they're called radical, racist, bigot, blah, blah, blah. 
The Occupy movement wants to dismantle our government. They're anarchists, Marxists. And they applaud them. Oh, they're just concerned citizens. They have a riot mentality. See, I grew up in a time when I was a part of that other group before I got saved. And it was, let's party and tear the place up. That's what it was. You know, through the Vietnam War years, you know, and the Vietnam protesters and that. And before I was saved, now I was part of that bunch. If I'd have been who I was then, now I'd be parked, I'd be parked out <laughs> somewhere in the middle of some city, smoking dope and doing <laughs> whatever. Because that's, what that's what they do. And, you know, Barack Obama likes them. He doesn't like the Tea Party, you know. I'm not going to get into all that. Okay. Any, any other comments or questions? Yes, Chuck. Yeah. Don't, he, he, he can't be the savior. No. You know, a political party, a, a candidate no. cannot be a savior. He can only do what he can do. And, you know, and I've, I've, said, this, I've said this before, you know, our nation, I'm, I don't want to ramble on, but a lot of people talk about our nation being founded on biblical principles and so forth. I don't believe it was. It was founded on enlightenment principles. It was founded on man-centered principles, okay? Uh, the, the way our Constitution is, is, is built. Is, they, they put in the very First Amendment what they call the Establishment Clause. It says two things. It says that the government will not establish a religion, nor will it hinder the practice thereof. So a lot of people like that first part, but they keep that second part out. And a lot of folks think that, you know, uh, you know faith and, and government don't go together. But you can't take them apart. As, as followers of Jesus Christ, our faith has to affect what we do, what Brother Jairus was saying. There's a bumper sticker that says, pray, vote, pray. <laughs> pray, vote, pray. I would say pray, vote if you want to. <laughs> if you don't want to vote, don't vote. You know, don't, don't vote for the lesser of two. You know, sometimes people say, well, the lesser of two evils. You know what? If they're both that bad, I ain't voting. You know, that's right, you know. And it's going to be in God's hands. But that's right. God is ultimately, ultimately, he's the one that's in charge. And if he allows our nation because, because of our, our nation's wickedness, our culture, our society, Let's turn his back on God. If he allows us to have leaders that lead us down the wrong path, I, I believe that's because that's what we've asked for as a nation. Okay, please. Uh, you know what? Let's have a word of prayer right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now Pastor Harold Malee is ministering to probably hundreds of policemen. Father, I pray, God, that you would send your spirit to be in that, that you would send your spirit to be in that funeral home right now. Well, I know you're there because Harold's there and there are other believers who are there. But, Father, I pray we stand in agreement with them right now, Lord, that some of these policemen will be confronted with the reality of their mortality. Father, that they'll be, they'll, they'll be faced with this decision that they have to make of how they want to live their lives, Father. They're heartbroken. They're saddened at this tragedy. But we pray, Lord, that you would anoint the words of Pastor Malie right now in the name of Jesus as he's preaching, as that ceremony is going on even right now. Father, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. And, Father, we'll thank you and we'll give you glory in the precious name of Jesus as we go from this place but not your presence. Father, guide our steps. Father, give us wisdom. Give us direction, Father, and help us as all this stuff is going on around us. Help us be at peace knowing that, Father, we are yours and whatever they do in Washington, whatever they do in Harrisburg, whatever they do in Greensburg or Pittsburgh, Father, it doesn't matter because we belong to you. We're your children. And whatever we got to go through, you're going to bring us through it. And we know, Father, that we have a hope of someday being at that great marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, we thank you for those promises. We ask that you go with us the rest of this week. Father, help us tell somebody about Jesus. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. amen. God bless you.